All right, so um, if you get uh, okay, my adjustments that they put, um, if you were here yesterday, you should be able to do a without a problem. If you are not here yesterday, then listen while I give you a quick rundown on what we did. Those of you who are here, do A, please. It's a little like rectangles in that we use trapezoids and they're better than rectangles. You still subdivide the region accordingly. They say divide the region into five. Five fifths or one five. Uh, five fifths, yes, good point. Okay? Now, you'll see that trapezoids tend to do a better job because they follow the curve much better. The error between the true curve and the segments is minimized. So trapezoids are a high quality estimator. Uh, now, I could do trapezoid formulas for all five and just do formula, 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 formula. But in each of those formulas, they would all have the same height. Now remember, in this case, the height is the distance between the parallels. So in this case, on these, the heights are actually on the x-axis. So I can factor a height and a divided by two out. And then I could say, in the first trapezoid, base one is f at zero, and base two is f at a fifth. But when I go to the next trapezoid, f at a fifth will also be base one of the next trapezoid. So the interior points, they all happen twice because they're part of one trapezoid on the left and one on the right. So there will be two f at ones when I find all the bases. Two f at two, one fifth, sorry. Two f at two fifths. 2f at 3 fifths, 2f at 4 fifths, and a single f at the edge is like 1. The height in this case would be 1 fifth. We, oui. we. Oui. So now doing this without a calculator, because calculators are for the week, 2 times uh, 120 fifth plus 2 times Eight hundred twenty fifths plus two times twenty seven hundred twenty fifths plus two times sixty four hundred twenty fifths plus one plus one. Okay, so one tenth of <coughs> two plus sixteen eighteen fifty four seventy two plus one twenty is two hundred. 200 plus 125 is 325, 125 fifths. That reduces to 5 plus 5 times, 13 times. So I get something like 13 fifths. Is that what you got, people? What do you mean, sure? That sure means no, I did. Yes, I got you. All right. <clears throat> 13 fifths is uh, 0.26 is a decimal, yeah? 26 hundredths? Yeah. Let's see how exact goes. To get this exactly, I could use the old fundamental theorem of calculus, sweet. Antiderivative, evaluate it, is 1 fourth or 0.25. Pretty good estimate? Yeah, what's the error? 0.01. It's 100 off, right? All right, then. Um, C we also did yesterday, so C should be good. When you talk about how much error from the estimate, there are three factors that contribute to the error. There's how wide the region is, which is B minus A. For math analysis reasons, that's Q. There's a 12 there, again, for math analysis reasons that we have to get into another day. I'll think about that. But another factor to the error is N. The more trapezoids, the less the error. So there's an inverse relationship. And then what also contributes to error is how much concavity. So you'll see this crazy M term where M is an upper bound for the second derivative on the interval 0 or A to B generally, but in this case 0. Okay. 
the more concave it is, the more arid it is. So that's why that's in there. For this problem then, what's B minus A? 1 minus 0. 1 minus 0. What's M? And M. <clears throat> Tell me, how do I go about finding M? The upper bound for the second derivative. Find the second derivative. Find the second derivative. First, it's hard to bound the second derivative if you don't have the second derivative. So the second derivative is? 6x. What is a logically chosen upper bound for the second derivative on 0 to 1? 6. six. The greatest it could be, on 0 to 1 anyway, is 6, right? Okay, so let m equals 6. That's my m. Uh, let's do a little bit of dividing out common factors. And so the error must be less than? 50. Was that, is that true? What was our error? 100. Is 100 less than 50? Yeah. Okay. So it's true. Um, keep in mind, again, that that's not the error. That's the bound on the error. I, it's a point. I know the error is not more than that. All right. Now, it is very often the case, especially in science, where you are using an estimation method and you require some degree of precision. I have to be this close. In order to get, for example, an estimate that is less than a 10,000th off, you would have to bump up the number of rectangles, right? Or trapezoids, excuse me. The question is, how many trapezoids would you need to get the error that small? That's the type of problem I didn't get into my notes, and I apologize, but we'll do one now. Um, so if it's error, then since the reason will probably be working in this error bound, maybe, yeah? And if I have the error is less than, now don't be in a rush to get that to the negative fourth. I'm not going to put it in there. I know the error is less than this. Okay. Now, if I can then find this less than 10 to the negative 4, then if the error bound is less than 10 to the negative 4, then surely the error itself must be less than 10 to the negative 4 as well, right? Do you agree? Okay. So I'm going to hang off on the error, and I'm going to talk about what n would have to be in order to get that error bound less than 10 to the negative 4. Well, I know B minus A, did it change now? Or am I still talking about the same region? Same region. Same region. So that's still 1 over n cubed. What about M? Did M change? No, it's still the second derivative, same region, so 6. What is left up in the air now is, man, how many trapezoids do I need? I prefer, rather than scientific notation, I would prefer to write this in function or fraction notation. That's what 10,000. I, I work better with that. It's up to you, but I find it easier. Um, Anytime you're working with inequalities in math, you should be careful because the rules aren't exactly the same as equations. I mean, we move stuff around, but there's sometimes where we have to split the sign and stuff, right? So be careful. If, for example, I wanted to move this out of the denominator, can I multiply both sides by n squared or 2n squared without fear of moving the sign? Yeah. Why? n squared is positive. Okay, so I can multiply that over. Can I also multiply 10,000 over to the other side? Yes. Yes, again, it's positive. So in this case, there's no issue of flipping the sign. I can be sure that that is holding true. Why don't you just leave the 2 over there? So you have to move it back over anyway. Uh, good question. I don't know. Wouldn't you say, though, that n is the square root of 5,000, which is probably 71, 2, 3? You have to go ahead and punch that in your calculator. I won't make you estimate the root, although that would be fun. With the method. 70 what? 70.7. 70. 70.7. 70. That's all, all I need is one decimal. Okay, so obviously now we answered the question in a non stupid kind of way. Okay, the question is how many trapezoids do you need to get error less than 10 to the negative fourth? And surely you will not say, I need 70.7 trapezoids, because that's the how many trapezoids do you need? 70 or 71? 71. You need 71. Okay. 71 or more trapezoids would get error below 1 per You say at least. At least you could say at least. Sure. Okay. All right. 
Uh, that's what I wanted to touch on, and so now we got that knocked off the homework, and let's go on to the new stuff. There is no, uh, I don't know, if I, if I give a quiz, it might be a one or two question, are you keeping up with your homework kind of stuff. Uh, but it should be fun. Would you go to the notes, please, and complete those two tables in all, I don't know, 20 seconds or less. Okay, so uh, the first, second, better table. Can we knock that out? No problem. Um, <laughs> Okay, we have a lot of makeup in there too, so you might have more than two. All right, so the first table, talk to me values, please. 24. 24. 3. 8. 3. 1. 2. Okay, good enough. Uh, the other one requires a little degree of thought. Uh, let's start off at zero and move forward. Zero. Zero. Negative one. Zero. So you're telling me that for all those positive x values, there is no change? Yes. Exactly, because absolute value on positive x has no effect, so they are unchanged. What is changed is negative. How do they behave? Eight. 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 Zero. 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 Negative one. You can see that negative x's behave or switch to positive. Okay. Um, so, if you are given that the function I made these from, the original function, not the absolute value, is x squared minus 2x, then would you sketch the three graphs? f, absolute value of f, and f, of absolute value of f. I suppose you could use your tables because they are, in fact, accurate. They do reflect these three graphs, if you need to check. So the first one obviously is a parabola with zeros at zero and two opening up. Wait, what does absolute value on the function do? What happens to positive y values? They stay the same. They are unchanged by the absolute value. What happens to negative y values? They get made positive. Okay. How about this then? Um, what happens to positive x values? They stay the same. There's no change to positive x values. Negative x values are changed. How do they behave? Exactly like the positive. Exactly like the positive. Is that then are the, those are the principles that work here. When you take the absolute value on something, whether it be y or x, positives are unchanged. Negatives behave by positives. And so in the case where you were talking y, these parts were positive, so they're unchanged. These parts were negative, so they behave positive. Wait. On this graph, these were positive x's, so they were unchanged. The negative x's that were normally here 
Never happened. They behave like positive. Okay. Uh, that's review, yes? Okay. Uh, this also should be a little review with a little sprinkling of new. Would you consider how to take the derivative of an absolute value function? Recall for me, if you're going to give somebody a pointer in one word, you'd say piece piece Ben, Ben, Ben. Do you need the graph to look at to write this in piecewise, or you can do this analytically? What would you do? Would you graph it, or would you do it analytically? Analytically, okay. If you did this analytically, which is kind of good practice, because sometimes you don't know the graph, you're kind of flying blind. How do you, what do you do? I need to find where it's zeros, whatever the graph is. I need to find where there's zeros so I can find where it's getting flipped, yeah? So I definitely need to start by finding zeros. Root 3 plus 2 sine of x. This is where fifth period broke my heart. They couldn't solve this basic bigger question. On 0 to 2 pi, what angles make that true? Uh, on that, on that, you know, I agree with negative pi over 3, but that's not on that. 5 pi. 4 pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3. Sine is negative in the lower two quarters. Are we with? Mm -hmm. Root 0 2 is a pi over 3 kind of version. Okay. Um, in terms of where it's normal, where is it flipped, I would need to then figure out where is it positive slash negative, yeah? So... Where is 3 plus root 3 plus 2 sine of x positive or negative? It's positive there. And then negative then positive. Did you actually sign test or you're, now you're just using graph? You did not sign test. I did It definitely <laughs> said. What value you did you plug in? Uh, 3 pi over 2 for the middle one. All right, all right. <coughs> Start with what? Zero. Oh, start with zero and say positive? And then you you assumed it was going to change each time? Or did you? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> okay. You have no confidence. Uh, yeah, sorry, you should do that. I'm in a math slump. I'm in a math slump. I got to tell you. Okay, so if piecewise, what would this be? Well, three plus two okay, because absolute value does no effect on positives, right? So it would stay the same in the places where it was positive, turn opposite where the places it was negative, and be the same positive. I suppose you could do this in two branches with a union if you wanted to. Um, what about inclusive or not on those endpoints? Which one? The outside one, don't make it inclusive. Okay. So I do include the endpoints in some place here. I thought I didn't include the endpoints. When is that? That's on the derivative. It's on the derivative I don't include. Okay, when it's flipping up at the corners, that's when the derivative doesn't exist there. But this graph is continuous at those points. They need to be included on the function itself, right? Okay. Um, 4 pi over 3. 5 pi over 3 uh, and oops, 5 pi over 3. Okay, cool. So I'm done, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I haven't actually done the question yet. What haven't I not done? Yeah, the goal is to find the derivative. I haven't done that yet. I haven't found the derivative. So the first branch derivative? 2 cosine, then negative 2 cosine, then 2 cosine. Now, on the intervals, inclusive or not? No. What about at the endpoints? No. Does the derivative exist at the endpoints? If you say no, why not? Uh, you can have a derivative up to and including an endpoint. I see what you're saying, but you can have endpoint derivatives. 
is there a sharp turn at the endpoint? And so you actually would include the endpoints. The derivative, it is differentiable at the endpoints. Not the interior ones, mind you, but the exterior ones you definitely can't include. You follow? Okay, now that's cool, and I gotta say that's by far the most common way to do absolute value driven piece But there is a lesser known, kind of more fun way to do absolute value derivatives. This is another way to do the derivative of that absolute value function without doing piecewise. How does it work? Logarithmic. Logarithmic. Let people think about it a second, then we'll talk about it. Sorry. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're interested in this cool. We'll talk about that. Think about how that works and why it works. No, logarithm logarithm. No, it's not it. Think about how the quantities work when they compare to each other. When they're the same and when they're not the same. So Oh, I see. Depending on the 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 how does this behave? No. Okay, it, so he said one. Always one? Plus or minus, Plus or minus one. When is it one? When, the positive. When, the, when they're both positive. Now, surely that would mean that in the cases where this is positive, the absolute value has no effect, and they're the same as one. I agree. Okay, so you're saying then that when this is positive, this is one, and the derivative is just two cosine x. But when this is negative, how does this behave? Negative. It's negative, and therefore it's the opposite of two cosine x. Yeah, yeah. So this makes this, although as complicated as it might sound, it's really just one and negative one right here. That's that's it's an oscillating figure between one and negative one. Um, and so that's another way of doing an absolute value graph. It's not done very often, but in a college setting, you'll see that once in a while. And so I wanted you to at least see it. Okay. Uh, piecewise is what I will expect you to do. <clears throat> now let's talk integrating. We've also touched on this a little when we did those movement problems. Um, there are still, still a handful of you, if I gave you, hey, here's the velocity function on 0 to 5, and I said, How, what's the distance traveled on 0 to 5? I would still see some people slap this at it. Okay or not okay? Why not? They're, they're finding displacement. They're not finding distance. To find distance, it's absolute value. And absolute value, you can't just say, forget it, I'll ignore the absolute value. You have to deal with the absolute value, right? How do you deal with the absolute value? You separate it up into flipped and non-flipped pieces, okay? That's what we're going to do here, except it's not distance now, it's just absolute value, generally speaking. So, um, I know that this guy gets flipped up from the previous problem at 4 pi over 3 until 5 pi over 3. Right, we decided that it was positive getting flipped up in there and then positive. Do you, do you agree? Are you with me? Okay, so if you were going to integrate this, you would have to break it into pieces. What three integrals is this equivalent to? Zero to four pi over three of same or negated? Same. Okay, do you want to, okay, the next region is from? 4 pi over 3 to 5 pi over 3. I can imagine two different ways of dealing with what we're about to do. What do we have to do in the next section? Negate it. Negate it inside each one or negate it outside negative outside? Negate it inside. 
So it's, it's your preference, but all right, I heard outside. Okay. That at least makes it so it's always the same antiderivative, which is left. Okay, and then the last region, um, 5 pi over 3 to 2 pi, unchanged or changed? Unchanged. All right, and then after that, you would. Okay, so let's. That's, I assume, at the end of that, you could in, integrate that, that'd be fine. <clears throat> so let's just leave it. So let's then talk about uh, the process here. If you go to integrate absolute value, what things will you do? What will you find? Graph. You'll need to, if graphing is possible, you graph it. But what if you don't know the graph? You'll need to find the zeros, and then you'll sign test to see what gets flipped up, or flipped up, or not. Right? And then once you know which parts were negative and got flipped up, then what do you do? You integrate pieces, you write it as a sum of integrals. Some pieces negated. Negative pieces negated, I guess you could say. <clears throat> right? So with that, try that problem on your own without a calculator to see if you could get that. Now you could do the graph on that, so it's not completely foreign boring, but <clears throat> Uh, I didn't put the negative up front. I brought the negative in, but you could have the negative up front. It's fine. Are you getting something like I'm getting? <clears throat> Negative 7 plus c e squared plus 4 log 2? Okay. Uh, 
Certainly, if we're integrating absolute value, then all our rectangles will have positive y's and positive x's, so we should yield positive x's. We should get positive x's. Right? Okay. That is that. <clears throat> Questions on 93. Um, and I, I might have to, I thought I posted, I fixed my mistakes on 94 extra practice, uh, but apparently I didn't share it properly or something, so I'll fix that tonight. Thank you. Sure. Okay, 15 did you say? 10. 15, 10. 4B. 4B. 22C. 22C. Good precision, I like it. I like it. That's a 15. Oh, what? Fifteen. It is. Um, first question for fifteen. Did you work both sides or just the average value side? Both sides, yes. Second, what did you get for the right side? The average value. Yeah, what did you get for the right side? The average value should be zero. So that's the issue on the right side, it sounds like. So let's go through it. C plus 1 to the 1 third equals 1 over B minus A. Actually, I'm using a mixture of two different forms. You don't need to write the general every time. I just, if I have it, do. So for this problem, I believe uh, a lot of people had an issue in the evaluating. The antiderivative was not the issue. The evaluating. So three fourths. X plus 1 to the 4 thirds. Do you agree with my antiderivative? Okay. I'm going to combine the 3 eighths out front. Now that would be 1 to the 4 thirds minus negative 1 to the 4 thirds. And people were calling that 2. And that, I believe, is your error. What is negative 1 to the 4 thirds? It's 1, not negative 1. And so this should be 0 here. And therefore, the left side is the star of the show. You're just solving C plus 1 to the 1 third, which implies that C must be, if that's going to be 0, then C's got to be negative 1. Wait. So it's probably just the evaluating the negative 1 to the 4 thirds is the common error. You bet. Ten. Question on ten. Is that still a question? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Ten. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of problems I find super cool and amazing, but these indeterminate forms are not one of them. I just kind of <laughs> cut it out and get through them. I, I just don't. I, usually, I see the beauty in a lot of problems, but this I just don't. I just doesn't do it. Still got to do it. You know, um, um, <clears throat> yeah, but I would have to dig hard to get some. Um, now that you're motivated to do these well, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's true. Uh, did you get a common denominator of x squared minus 1? Yeah. And then this became 3 minus 2 times the sum of x plus 1, which you probably did that and this in one step. But I get negative 2x minus, two. Uh, minus 1. Yeah, over minus x. Two. Uh, minus 2. Oh, wait, no, I, oh, wait. Isn't it plus? Wait, wait. It's plus 1, right? Sorry. Plus, yeah, yeah. plus 1. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, now. Every stage of the game, you should try and say, can I direct substitute? If I direct substitute, I get something like negative 
2 plus 1, so negative 1 over 0, right? So it's undefined. So that's, all right, now I'm not crazy about undefined. It is undefined, and most multiple choices would have a DNE, and you would choose it. But let's go further, shall we? Let's do it. Um, would this be, you say 0, but it's really a small number. Is it small positive or small negative? Positive. I agree. If it's approaching one from above, it's more than one, so this would be positive. So positive, small. That implies this would approach what's negative divided by small positive. Negative. It's, it's, uh, negative negative. Right. That to me is that, that's better. Okay. Okay. Um, 4B, is that still a question? Yeah, it's just, I'm confused about right. know, the bound, I guess. Yeah, the bound. Did you find that it was negative on one third and two, or sorry, from one third to two thirds? Yeah, well, when I looked at your key on line, but yours only goes from one third to two thirds, so. Yeah. Oh, because it says find the total distance traveled in the negative x direction, not the total distance. Yes. Okay. 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 All right. Twenty-two uh, C. Is twenty-two C still a question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Twenty-two C. Um, did you get in part A something like the region R is k log k? Minus k plus one. Yeah. Okay. I got a and b. Okay. So, so the idea is this: you've got this region. K is a uh, end line, and if k gets bigger and bigger and bigger, then the area gets bigger and bigger. So as k moves up four units every second, at what rate does the area change? At the time it's rooting. Okay. So in terms of interpreting, this is a related race problem because there is a time component. So when they say k is moving upward at a rate of 4 units per second, what is that in calculus? I Okay, so I am, that's, that's, that was the issue in the last class. It's not dy dt. I understand why you're saying that because it's moving up, but if you use that, and this is the R expression. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no Y in there. So really, what I think the imp implication is, it's not dy dt. It's not y that's changing. It's k that's changing. Now, that might be the y. k is a constant, but it's not a constant. It's a moving upper bound. So it's dk dt that's positive 4. And then you just use that equation. Yeah, integrate this with respect to time. Okay. Does that get you going? Or not integrate, sorry, differentiate this with respect. Okay. Um, I think that's it on 93. Any other 93? 94 you turned in in class, yeah? Yes. You did? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 95. Yeah. The extra credit. Oh, 94 extra practice. Yeah. That's next? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Sure, why not? 94 extra practice. What are you Fourteen, yes. My key was wrong the first time, and then I fixed it, but then I did post direct. So it's possible if you say fourteen that you might have done it right, and my key was wrong. Well, I, I just like I got a negative answer. Oh, so that's then never mind. You did it wrong. Yeah, so I just learned. Can you just give the answers to fourteen and sixteen? Right? Yes, I can. <coughs> So I posted them on a scan. Then what I do is make this one. Okay, yes, okay. 14 I had wrong the first time through. It's 30.159, not 90, whatever I had. And 16 should be 171.795. I had those wrong on my key originally. and. I apologize. Okay. All right. So 14. Here we go. 14. These are kind of fun to draw, right? So you have y equals 2. You've got this parabola function. And 
It's revolved around y equals negative 4, which means now it's going to be here. And if I revolve that little section through the board and around, it would make kind of like a tire. Wait. Wait. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Tell me, what variable really would you, should you use? X. Yeah, you want to use X because that is not a function of Y. X is good, Y is terrible. If you use a slice of X and revolve such a slice, what's, what's me? Okay, Alasher, here we go, yay. <clears throat> Pi, big R squared minus little r squared, and it's dx. Okay, in the limits of integration, I think you'll agree or zero to two because that's where the graph is. Yeah. Okay, so big R. First common error that you see in, in talking to people. You always look at the original region to the axis of revolution. So make sure you're looking only in there, not down here. Um, what is, big R is here, all the way out to the outside. If, if I, yeah, if I draw these, it's always zero minus negative four. And so in essence then, that's always four, <clears throat> which makes sense. Okay, the outside is solid flat. The inner radius is both green. It's here, and then here, and then here. Upper minus lower. What's the upper of each of those greens? The function. The function in the lower. Right. So it should be the function x squared minus 2x minus negative 4, or plus 4. And that's little r. I don't even have that. I just put in my calculator. Oh. I got negative 4,000. Oh, no, you must have put it in wrong because that's that. Okay. Cool. Oh, your calculus is good then. Okay. Any other questions on 9? Yes, ma'am. 16. 16? Yep. That's uh, uh, one of the ones I missed the first time too. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> 16. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, 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 I just I missed this. They said slump, I'm slump. So you have this parabola, and y equals x plus 1. And so this region in green is what we have found. Now, I definitely used x because, again, the parabola is not a, for a couple reasons. Uh, the problem is not a function of y, it's two functions of y, and it would be, if you used y, it would be two regions, so it's just x all the way. x is always one upper minus lower the whole time, so x, x, x. Um, if I go negative 2, that's, oh, I'll need those intersection points, I'll find those in a second. If I go around negative 2, then I would look something like this. So my revolution would look like that only. And it would have a hole inside. Okay. <clears throat> kind of like, yeah, whatever. Um, so what kind of, if we revolve an X slice, so we're looking at shells, washers, or discs? Shells, okay. So that's 2 pi r h d s. Okay. So in all cases, r looks like this distance or this distance or this distance. If I look at all those blue segments, those are horizontal. Now, please, I beg you. The most common error here is trying to go too fast to get the curve in. Where do I put the function? You gotta put the, people are trying to put the function in all the time, every time. 
Take your time. Instead, look at these. These are all horizontal, so they're right minus left. What about the right edge? Is it constant or varying? It's varying. A varying point. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it's on the line. I don't care if it's on the line. Forget the line. It's a varying horizontal point. We call that F. The left side is always negative 2. Now, the question is, all right, do I put the function in for that x? The answer is no. You don't put the function in because you're integrating with respect to x, and x is good. Leave it alone. <clears throat> the heights will come. Believe me, the functions will come in. They'll be there. Just be patient. The heights of each of those cylinders, that's here or here or here. The heights are vertical, therefore upper minus lower. The upper point, it's a varying vertical point, so it's definitely a varying vertical point. That's a lot. The lower point, it's also varying. It's a varying vertical point. It's a Y. But that I can't keep. Ys can't stay. I'm integrating with respect to X, so I have to sub in. That's where the curves come in. Y1 is the upper Y, so in place of Y1, I put the line. X plus 1. And Y2 is points on the parabola. In place of Y2, I put the parabola equation. And uh, the other thing, if this is where I must, I had that set up properly when I did this, but for whatever crazy reason on my limits of integration, I had 0 to 2. I have no idea what I was thinking. The limits of integration are the same as the previous problem. Uh, you have to find them, report them to 3, and I think they were negative 0 0.302 for the leftmost x of the region, and 3.302. For the rightmost point. And this is a dx, that's not an x. Okay? It's a thought process, really. You have to kind of get it to the state of mind and think through it correctly. It's not just a memorized technique. You know, yes? Does this become a question? Would you just find a specific problem? Yeah. I was just having trouble figuring out why. Yeah, because why do you only use x to stop that for others? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, it depends on the two things that would force one variable only are, first of all, is it a non-function versus non-function? And by that I mean, can you write it as one equation only. So, for example, on when I say x minus, when I'm dealing with x minus 2x, if I'm working with that in any fashion, I would always use x because in x I can write it as one equation. There it is. But if I go to write this in y's, if I want to call this two different y sections, then it has to be with the plus or minus. It would be y plus this and y minus that. that it's just gross. And so it has to do, first of all, is it a function of one variable? Sine definitely is that case also. Any trig function, you definitely want to go with what it's a function of. So if you're dealing with sine, you definitely use that's only never y. Uh, the other thing that will go through my head is two regions versus one. If I had a region that looked like this, I would use x there because in x, it's always one region, and in y, it's two. Those are, those are the things that force it, OK? Good question. Have a nice day. I know you already explained to me how to do the shift, but I'm happy to explain it until my lips fall.